Smart pick. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of this week on 10th of September. I'm Mount Green from TO Delft, a colleague of Harding, who unfortunately cannot make it today. It's my pleasure to host you all together with Sebastian Geiger from Harriet Watt. We are especially grateful to all our keynote lecturers who accepted our invitation and to you all for joining us this week and combat work from home isolation. Please also subscri subscribe to our YouTube channel, then you can also see our upcoming talks. To our student attendees, please attend the Porous Media Tea Time talk series to share your research and broaden your network. So now to the lecture. We are pleased to announce our keynote speaker of this week, Dr. Charlotte Adams. She is the commercial manager for mine energy at the Coal Authority. Formerly, she worked at Durham University and still remains an advisor to them, to the Durham Energy Institute. Prior to that, she worked in Renewable Energy Consultancy, um, which I really, what I really like, her interest in abandoned mines began in her school days uh, during trips to mines in Cumbria. So her background is in geology and hydrogeology, and she gained her PhD from the Newcastle University in 1999. In her PhD, she focused on treating the ecotoxic discharges flowing from historically abandoned lead seams mines in the North Pennines. And later she worked on coal mines, looking at the timescales for mine water emergence after abandonment. And also she designed low-cost passive treatment systems for treating eventual mine water outflows. Taking mine water samples from above and also below ground uh, sparked her interest in the heat potential of mine water. And she's been promoting the geothermal opportunity for mine waters ever since. That also I really like. So I'm really looking forward to your talk. It's our pleasure to un and honor to host Charlotte in our Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of this week. To the audience, please note uh, this lecture will last for about 30 minutes, followed by questions and discussions. Like before, please type your questions in the chat room and Sebastian will go through them after the talk. Charlotte, thanks once more. The stage is yours. Thank you, Maren, for the introduction and thank you to Hadi and Sebastian for the invitation to be here today and thanks to you all for coming to listen. So I joined the Coal Authority in February and was formerly at Durham University for 11 years. Um, and prior to that, I've worked in both academia and kind of energy consultancy. So today I'll be talking about the work we're doing at the Coal Authority and how we're using the abandoned mines across the UK to decarbonise heat. So when I went to join the Coal Authority and I was telling some of my friends and colleagues that I was moving on from the university, quite a few people said to me, well, we don't even know we had a Coal Authority. What do we actually do? So we're um, a non-departmental government body. So we have a sponsoring department within the UK government, which is BAES, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And we are created by the 1994 Coal Act and effectively we own and manage the UK coal mines. And we have around about 23,000 abandoned deep coal mines in the UK, and they underlie many of our major towns and cities, which is not surprising because many of them grew on the strength of the coal that they mined and traded. And nine out of 10 of our largest urban areas based on geographical size is underlain by a coal field. So we see this as great potential to decarbonize large urban areas. So the things that we do at the Coal Authority, our role really is for the protection of both people and the environment. So that involves dealing with the ground stability issues that have been created by mine abandonment. So things like subsidence um, and collapses are things that we deal with on a daily basis. And also in the on the environmental side, we deal with um, water emergence as mines have recovered and flooded once we're turned off. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but effectively, we manage around about 75 mine water treatment schemes across the UK. In some of those places, we pump water out and treat it. In some places, it drains under gravity and we treat it. And in doing so, we, we protect water courses and also public supply aquifers from mine water. So um, the abandoned mine plan archive, we have basically a whole building down at our head offices, which is in Mansfield near Nottingham. And that building contains um, all of the mine plans, some of them dating back 
to 1872, one or two earlier ones. But basically there was a coal mines regulation act that came in that said whenever a mine was abandoned, there's a statutory requirement to deposit plans with the Secretary of State upon abandonment. And that's because when people were putting new mines down, they sometimes didn't realize there was a mine next to them. And if they broke through into that, they could have things like in rushes of water and there were several accidents happened, which meant that we needed to have greater control on where mining had taken place and have a repository for all the information that was being collected. So we have this great store full of plans. Some of them, the older ones are still um, like printed on fabric, very old. And we have all the surveyors notebooks that accompany them as well. So we can have, have a look at the actual original notes that were taken underground. We don't have them for everything because there was a lot of mining that took place pre 1872. So in some places we have what we call unrecorded workings. So often we infer those that if there's been working on a coal seam, then we know round about that time, then we know that there's likely to have been earlier working in that area as well. So that has implications for when we drill into the mines. So we need to be aware of unrecorded workings. And not all of the mines are within our ownership. Some are owned by local authorities and still some are still owned by private individuals, perhaps like estates and things like that. They still own them. So where the mines are in private ownership, we don't always have the plans. So that can make things a bit more complex. So the UK coal industry, um, over the past 300 years or so, there's been 17 billion tonnes of coal mined from the UK subsurface. And that ended in uh, December 2015 with the closure of Kellingley Colliery in North Yorkshire. So that's around about four miles east of the big power station that was at Ferry Bridge that used to burn coal. Um, the coal burning there ended in 2016. And you can see from the graph here that basically coal output has changed over this time and the, the way in which it's changed and the rate of decline and coal use over the years has been shaped by kind of political events such as wars and miners strikes. Technology as we've changed from steam to diesel and electric trains, for example, and also cheaper imports and alternative fuels. So, for example, the, the dash for gas um, led to decline in coal, as did cheaper imports from elsewhere. So in June, we celebrated two months in the UK without using coal to generate any electricity. So that was the longest period we had gone without using coal since 1882. And obviously it's being phased out of our energy mix now as we move forwards. The picture on the right here shows one of the pits that's not far from where I'm based in the northeast. So this is at Dordan on the northeast coast. And here the miners are celebrating having taken their one million ton of coal out of the mine. So there was a lot of kind of um, benchmarking of the output of the mines and it, it was significant. Some of them produced an awful lot of coal over their period of working. So thinking about mine abandonment, given that the last deep mine in the UK shut in 2015, so that was Kellingley, whilst mines were operating, they were all pumped so that the miners could safely access the coal. But as soon as they're abandoned, the pumps are turned off. Pumping water costs an awful lot of money. So that's one of the first things to be shut off when a mine's abandoned. And over periods usually of decades, maybe one or two decades, depending how deep the water level was to start with, the water levels then begin to rise and recover to pre-mining levels. But by working the mine, um, we have created new pathways in which the water can move around. So that can cause emergence at surface. So if you look over on the left, um, just where you can see there's kind of like a bit of a valley and there's a, a mine level that intercepts with that and the water level now sits above that. You could see there that potentially that could be a point of emergence. And on the right where you've got the water table that's still recovering, you could imagine that the um, as the water level comes up, if, if the layer just beneath the surface there was an aquifer you could see that potentially how the rising mine water could threaten an aquifer which would be used for public supply. So across the UK we've got some areas where the water level has now recovered as shown there where the, you've got kind of a static level and then we've got areas such as South Wales for example and areas of Nottingham near around where we're based where 
it's still rising. So that means that in future we'll probably need more mine water treatment sites. So we build more each year and also more monitoring. And we, we treat um, the mine water when it emerges. So we either, if it comes out under gravity, then we treat it if it needs to or, or, or not some, some mine water quality such that we don't need to treat it. Uh, if it doesn't come out in the, the place where we want it to, we can put a borehole down. Um, perhaps if it does need treating, we don't have the available land, we can put um, a borehole down and pump it out. So in some places we pump, some places they drain under gravity. Where we do pump, if possible, we try and put other renewables onto the site. So for example, at some of our large pumping schemes, we have photovoltaic, which offsets some of our electricity consumption. So in terms of repurposing the legacy that's been left as a result of the mining industry, we have several kind of products that we that we are working with. We produce a lot of water. So the water we produce is equivalent to the daily water demand of around about two million people. And last year, the Environment Agency predicted that England could run short of water within 25 years. So we're looking at whether we can use the mines as a supply, depending on the quality and the location of where we're pumping in relation to the end users, that's one thing we're looking at. Potentially the mines could be used to capture floodwaters as well, where we've got dry workings. And ultimately we're looking at the role of mine water in improving water resilience in the future. We also produce ochre. So in order to treat the mine water, the, the main thing we do is aerate it. And as soon as you get air into the water, the iron that's often um, our biggest challenge in mine water then drops out of solution, precipitates as ochre. Over time, that builds up in the treatment system. So periodically we remove that and it has several uses for water treatment because it's really good at absorbing things like phosphate. So we can use it for stripping unwanted things out of other water treatment streams. We can use it as pigment and we can also put it into soils as an improver. And then lastly is mine energy, which will be the focus of today's talk. So I probably don't really need to tell this audience too much about this, but really the key thing here is that the mine energy is classed as being different to ground source heat, which is effectively um, solar energy, which has warmed the first few tens of metres of the Earth's surface. So we're talking about mine energy being sourced from the deep geothermal source, which is the Earth's core. The deepest mines we have in the UK are around about 1.4 kilometres and there we see temperatures of up to 40 degrees. Most of the ones we work with day to day are shallower than that and the temperatures we're dealing with on a daily basis are probably something like 14 to 20 degrees. This is an example of um, our mapping system that we have. So this is an area of Durham and just shows you what a heavily mined area looks like to us. So here you've got workings on, um, this is just on one particular seam, and then you've got um, areas showing where the mines worked and also where the mine entries were. So the little kind of red crosses are where the mine entries were. They may be shafts or adits, depending on how the mine was accessed. And that's important because we need to look at the maps to find out how the mine was worked. So there's two types of working generally. So pillar and stoop, which is the one at the top, which was the earlier form of mining that was used. So basically you mine out areas like rooms, leaving pillars of coal to support the workings as you go. And then um, the other more recent is long wall. So that's where you drive out tunnels as far as you're going to go into the mine. And then as you retreat from the mine, you work kind of laterally across the seam, removing more or less everything. So it's sometimes called total extraction. And as you're doing so, the roof is collapsing behind you as you retreat and um, so you're left with this kind of crumbly broken rock filling the workings which we call gof. So we, you've got different characteristics associated with that if you're thinking of drawing water out for a mine energy system. The, the room and pillar workings generally stand open a lot more so frost is maybe something like 50%. We don't know exactly what happens to them after closure there will be some collapse in there but we generally work on a 50% frosty for those. And for the areas of long wall, we look at something like 20% porosity because it's much more compacted because it's broken rock material that's kind of been collapsed and compressed. We also think about how the mines are connected together and they often behave in blocks. 
and we know how they behave because of all the monitoring points we have. So we monitor water levels at around about 800 points across the UK and we see how the different mines fill up after they've been abandoned and how they communicate with each other. So that enables us to know when one mine's filled, is it overspilling into another mine or will it be coming out at surface? So we can kind of group the mines in terms of their hydrogeological performance as blocks. So each block may contain several mines and then obviously the UK coal fields are comprised of several blocks with subcategories of mines within them. And then we can kind of construct these diagrams such as the one at the top, which is from one of the sites we're looking at in Wales. And it just shows you how the seams are connected together. What are the connections between collieries and how do the kind of mine shafts link into that, which is important for designing a mine energy system because we need to know how the water is moving around the workings. And then the photo at the bottom shows one of the things that we'd ideally want to target for a mine energy system. So this is a roadway that you'd probably get in a, a long wall system and you can see the um, the steel rings in the roof there. So these structures are vast and they do tend to remain open after abandonment. So they're really good targets as long as you don't hit one of the metal rings when you're drilling, which has happened and can cause problems because they're very difficult to get through. Um, but these are great targets because they can flow substantial quantities of water and we know that they tend to remain open after abandonment. And when we're starting on a mine energy scheme, we um, go to the mine plans first and really it's, it's look depending on what you get because they're of variable age and quality because the mines were worked at different times. We find, for example, in the Durham coal field, a lot of the early working where the coal is shallower took place to the west of the coal field. And over time it deepened um, as technology moved on and it moved further east. So what we tend to find is maybe the mine plans for the east are slightly more modern and slightly better than the ones further west. And we can see on the, the kind of pink plan there, you've got this grid pattern which shows the room and pillar workings that I was talking about before. And then you've got this kind of pink speckled area. That's where you've got areas of long wall. So it's quite common that if a mine was worked for room and pillar, they would maybe go back in at a later date and rework it for long wall because there was sufficient coal left in the pillars to make it still economic to do that. You can see the one on the right, which is um, one from this is also a plan from the northeast and you, the blue bits again that shows somewhere that they'd had room and pillar working and they'd gone back in to do long wall and the mine managers basically filled that in with watercolor to show the areas where long wall mining took place and some of the plans are really nice. They're, um, really beautifully illustrated some of them and the mine managers took a lot of pride in their work when they did them. But you can see when you compare the two that the, the blue one is much more difficult if you're wanting to georeference that to try and hit one of those little tunnels that's maybe 200 meters below the surface. You've got a bit of a challenge on if that's, that's your starting point. So it's kind of, it's look really as to what the, what the quality of the plans is like. Um, and if we're looking to design a mine energy system, when we're looking at the plans, we need to have more than one seam as well, because we want to have a source to take the water from and a source to re-inject it back to. So ideally, we're looking for at least two seams with a bit of separation between them because there can be fracturing between the seams and that would cro cause cross connections. So we're looking for maybe, you know, two seams at least for a mine energy project. Water temperature is also important and we're often asked, well, how long will the source last? And, you know, is it a sustainable source of heat longer term? So the way we've approached this is we have looked at historic underground temperature data that was collected in the 1920s and 30s. So these are shown by the dots on the graph here. And basically this was done because the UK government at the time wanted to increase the output from the coal mines and wanted the mines to deepen to increase output but there was a limit to the temperatures that people could actually work in so this work was done basically to look in look in the deep mines to see what the temperatures were and to see which ones were kind of at their limit in terms of safe working temperatures at that time so the dots all represent dry rock temperatures taken when the mines were open and then the wiggly lines are where we've taken temperature profiles 
um, down flooded mine shafts where we've had access to them. And you can see that there's some similarities there. We've got similar um, temperature points at similar depths. So we are fairly comfortable that the temperatures that we see in the shaft profiles that we got reflect equilibration with the rock and show us that temperatures have been fairly constant between now and then, and that they are driven by the geothermal gradient, which is around about 35 degrees per kilometer in the UK. In some places, um, some of the shafts we pump from, and by doing so, we managed to elevate the temperature near the surface. We're not quite sure why, we know that they stratify, um, but it's quite interesting for us to see that we can get higher temperatures close to surface, just as a result of our pumping activities. We work closely with the British Geological Survey and they've just done a map of um, temperatures across the coal field, which will be added as a layer to our interactive viewer that we have online at the moment. So eventually you'll be able to have a look at the temperatures across the UK with the work that the BGS have been doing. So the main reason for looking at mine energy is as a route to decarbonising heat because heat is a lot accounts for a large portion of our energy demand and is, at the moment it's predominantly derived from fossil fuels. So if you look at the difference between the highest um, gas demand in the winter and the lowest in the summer, it's around about 4000 gigawatt hours, which is about eight times the amplitude of the electricity system. So when all the conversations are leading towards how much can we electrify heat, then is it really feasible that we can meet that massive kind of swing in demand from, from the electricity network that we have existing at the moment? So the way we've approached it, if you think about it, if we can use a heat pump with an abandoned mine, then because the coefficient of performance of the heat pump is, should run up at about four to five, so for every kilowatt of electricity you put in, you get four or five kilowatts of heat out, then you can see that potentially we could quarter or have one fifth of the electricity demand to produce the same amount of heat. So that's why we advocate the use of heat pumps with mine energy as a source of decarbonized heat. And especially if you can then offset the electricity use of the heat pump from a, a renewable source. So just thinking about how we deploy mine energy. So we estimate that there's enough heat sat in the coal field to heat all of the buildings overlying it. Obviously there's some technical challenges to doing that because that, that would require a lot of retrofit, but potentially there's a significant quantity of heat down there. There's no interseasonal variation in the source temperature. So your coefficient of performance of your heat pump should remain constant year round unlike air source heat pumps or river source where it fluctuates. And we normally base the systems that we design on removing about four or five degrees from the ambient mine water temperature. So we might start off with something between 10 and 20 degrees. We'd drop that by four or five degrees and then we'd re-inject that water back into the surface to be reheated. So that's, that's the kind of way we work it. And we're looking that for every megawatt of heat that we want out of the mine, we'd expect to have to pump around about 50 litres per second to get that out. We're also looking at whether we could um, take more than five degrees out. So that would then reduce the flow rate and maybe reduce the costs of the boreholes. But then you've got um, a, a difference in the cost of the heat exchanger on surface because that would have to be bigger to remove more heat. So we're looking at kind of how to optimize these systems with some of the work we're doing at the moment. And unlike geothermal aquifer systems where you may be going into a sandstone aquifer, um, less boreholes are needed because the workings are so good at storing and transmitting water that we can get away with fewer boreholes. And in some cases, the wells can be quite close together because if we're taking the water from and returning it to different seams. We can have a very long flow pathway underground, but actually both of the boreholes could be in the same site, maybe within a few meters of each other. So that means it's quite good because you can often put all the boreholes within the site that the client's got. So it, it works quite well from that point of view. So this diagram is a rather simplistic way of we, uh, the way you would do it. But in practice, we've been doing quite a lot of work lately. Some of our projects are about to drill 
on how we build in um, resilience and flexibility to the system, because you wouldn't want to be relying on one borehole for all your energy supply in case something happened to that. So we're thinking about maybe having a combination of two abstractions with one reinjection well, so that that gives you flexibility when you don't want your peak output. So you could just run one well instead of running pumps in both. Um, and it means that you could maintain the pumps in one well whilst you're running the other one as well. So it builds in a bit of resilience and also flexibility. So this is um, a graph from our Sea and Garden Village project, which I'll, I've got a slide on that later. But this is where we've had a look at the carbon savings over the period of the project. And this is compared to the counterfactual, which would be gas boilers in this case. And you can just see that um, the difference in carbon between the gas boiler case and the, and the heat pump case. And the reason this graph has steps in it is because the development here, it will be a housing development and it's planned over several different phases. So each step represents more homes being built on the site, which is why there's an increase over the time. But we, um, for this site, we found that using the mine energy offers a stable um, energy price going forwards. We've got stable temperature here. This site we're looking at, we've pumped mine water for a long time. So we know that it's constantly been 20 degrees for a long time. We can expect uh, heat pump coefficients of maybe four or more. And there's also a, a really positive impact on local air quality because instead of each home having an individual gas boiler, it would have a heat exchange, uh, well, either a heat pump or a heat interface unit, depending on how you design the system so that the air quality locally is much improved as well. So district heat networks are really compatible with mine energy. You can put your boreholes more or less anywhere around the heat network. There's no fuel to transport. Um, the lower temperatures offer higher efficiencies compared to gas-fired CHP systems, because when you're running your heat network at a lower temperature, your system losses are much lower as well. And they offer an alternative that can be used at scale in former mining areas, particularly in the UK when gases, new gas connections will no longer be available from 2025. So it offers a solution for heat decarbonisation at scale. And there's um, several opportunities and ways you can configure these systems. So you can have a centralised system where you'd have an energy centre and a lot of systems are being designed on that because that's similar to the CHP model that's been used a lot over the last few years. And there you'd have higher temperatures up to 60 degrees C. So your heat pumps would be effectively near where the water is coming out of the ground and the water be circulated around the heat network after it had been boosted by the heat pump. So for that, you need an energy centre and then each connected building would have a heat interface unit, which would then take the heat from the network to the building. You can use um, non-metal non pipework, which can bring the cost down, although some are still metal, but you can use non-metal if it's at 60 degrees. Um, and you, can, you kind of want to have the boreholes near to the energy centre if you can for this one, although there may be potential to have them elsewhere. A decentralised system gives you a bit more flexibility and might be something that you could do where you'd want to build it out over a period of time. You don't need to have space for an energy centre um, and the heat, point, the heat pumps are at the point of use. So you would circulate um, water at the ambient mine water temperature around the network. And because of the super low temperatures, these would run on maybe 30 or 40 degrees, something like that, or even lower then you can have non-metal pipe work and you could have boreholes placed more or less anywhere on the network because it doesn't really matter where the mine source feeds into this. So it's quite a bit more flexible. In terms of the potential, we're looking at um, the bigger system and how we could integrate other energy sources and other demands with the mine system. So for example, we could use renewables, so we could use um, spare, electricity from wind to produce heat and store it within the mines. We could use waste heat from data centres or energy from waste plants or from sewage. 
and that could go in the mines. And we're also looking at using the mines almost as the heat network underground so that we can use that to convey the heat maybe from one area to another area. And you can see there in the diagram we're saying if you could raise the temperature of the workings up to about 40 degrees, then you could have a housing development tapping into that, taking, um, taking water out. And then following on from that, you could also have something like a horticulture project as well. So you're maximizing the use of the asset. And also by building into storage, it really improves the economic case for doing it. And this has got knock-on benefits for us. So for example, in the horticulture project, we're looking at whether we can um, improve food resilience by growing more things in the UK, which has been a problem during the um, past, past few, week, few months with the pandemic. I'm not sure, is my, can, I, can anyone still hear me? My connection's just dropped. Yes, we can hear you fine, okay, Charlotte. Just asking me to reconnect, so sorry, I'll just do that. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, my it says I'm not connected anymore, but obviously I am, so I'll just carry on. Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. It was just, I was worried it would just cut me off then. It does that sometimes. So the other things we're looking at, um, we're looking at storage. We're looking at um, storage in mine shafts is something we're quite interested in. So there's 177,000 known mine entries. Um, and some of those are shafts, quite a lot of those are mine shafts. We, we have some information on the condition of some of them. Some of them are open. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been filled, but they do offer opportunities for thermal storage by asking as flasks, acting as flasks, sorry, and they can also be used for hydrogen storage. And we've been looking at um, people that are interested in dropping weights down them to use them for electricity production as well. So they've got quite a lot of use and a big piece of work we plan to do next is to assess the shafts we've got, see what and see which ones are open, see where they're near end, end users and what potential they have. So we've got several opportunities for our mine energy projects. We've got some that are located around places where we're already pumping water out or water's already flowing under gravity, um, which can be really good because often we're handling large quantities of water. So maybe there's two or three megawatts of heat available there. The complexity there is that the location might be constrained because we were already pumping at one site and it may not have a heat load next to it. Although in some cases we are looking at um, potential to move things around if we need to, to make best use of the resource. And there's also kind of single sites where you've got one example that we're working on in County Durham is a leisure centre. But for a single building, it's quite expensive. The borehole drilling costs, the capital, um, upfront capital is quite expensive. So. Um, they're a bit more um, risky in terms of the economic case. The heat network opportunity is great because you've got economies of scale and there's um, obviously lots of business opportunities around that associated with selling heat. But again, the upfront capital cost is high. Um, if you've got an existing discharge, then you don't need boreholes, but you've still got the heat network to put in. And you've got many clients. Um, and at the moment, there's a, a bit of a lack, lack of regulation surrounding kind of trading heat in the UK, so that would all need to change as well. These are some of the project stages we go through. So generally with the work we do, we're usually involved in those first two stages of feasibility. Um, we operate the license, we um, do the licensing for heat access agreements and the environment agency do the licensing for the water abstraction. So it's kind of a joint process between the two of us at the moment. Um, so we get involved in all of that kind of feasibility work and we also support on the well drilling and borehole testing. So we look at the performance of the wells once they've gone in um, to see how they're performing and see what heat loads they're providing. Quite often we don't know exactly um, what the depth to water might be and what the temperature might be and what the connecti 
connectivity of the workings is. So that's when we do this pilot drilling and testing. And from that, we then review that and then see how we'd move forwards to get the final scheme in based on those data. So the way to get the best out of the project is to have high hours of usage. So if you've got a mixed range of demands on the system, then you can maximize the use of that asset. Having a, having a range of customers demand and having kind of one source almost feeding another. So you could take water from the mine. And in this case, maybe if you've got one of our pump mine waters at 20 degrees, you'd take five degrees out and you'd use it for a housing development. Then you'd have a source at 15 degrees, which could then go into a horticulture project. Then you could drop it by another five degrees and still return it at, at 10 if you needed to. So we realized that by doing that and sweating the asset, you can make a much more economic case for doing it. And also there's a lot more opportunities for job creation because you've got kind of a housing um, opportunity there and you've got an opportunity to sell heat to homes, but you've also got maybe something like a horticulture project, which could also create jobs and um, heat sales for that industry as well. So um, you also need to think about anchor loads. So who's going to be there long term to use the heat that you could supply? We're looking at which industries could use the heat that we've got. It's effectively low grade heat. So we're looking at how to target them and how they could make best use of it. We're looking at storage as well, because we see that again as a way to maximize the use of the asset. And then there's also the social drivers of many former mining areas are still suffering from deprivation. So we're looking at whether the mine energy can provide a solution to that. So some of the challenges, we've got changes to the kind of um, heat incentive, which is a kind of feed-in tariff for heat that's operating in the UK, which will be removed in 2022 and has been changed over the past few years. So we need to see what will come along to replace that and how that will work. Interaction of state aid and, and subsidies. Um, as I've mentioned, lack of regulation for selling heat in the UK. How do we replace this kind of labour intensive industry that was um, that was based in a lot of these former mining areas? How can we what can we bring along to replace that to you know help with the deprivation and create jobs? And um, we're also thinking about you know the end users, so people will have to maybe think of new ways of using heat. So they may be using lower temperature heat. Heat will be traded as well, whereas it's not really at the moment. And we've got these kind of embryonic heat markets. Um, how will that work? How will that go forwards? Who wants to take responsibility for those? All those kinds of things to think about. And also ensuring that projects are developed well. So there are some projects that we're aware of that have taken place and that things have gone wrong, um, generally because of poor advice. So we're trying to try and educate as much as we can about this and um, develop a mine energy bible is something we want to do so that going forwards we can ensure that projects work well because we just want to see them succeed. So the opportunities this list um, grows on a daily basis because we get lots of new inquiries every day um, but we've got you know around about 100 projects where we've had interest um, and 74 of those are ones where there's potentially a viable a viable opportunity so there's absolutely loads going on at the moment it's a really exciting time to be involved with it all and this is one of our projects that's closest to um, development so we've got a mine water treatment system which is in the red circle on that diagram where we pump um, around about 150 litres of water out at 20 degrees constantly and that's treated before it goes into the sea and the plan there is to connect it to a new build development of 1400 homes, half of which will be affordable, half of which will be private. And this, the water will be circulated at 60 degrees. So this was going to be a centralized model where the um, heat pumps will raise the temperature to 60 degrees. That will go around the heat network and each um, home will have a heat exchange, heat interface unit. So that means it can have normal radiators, which was something the developers were very keen on. So this project is due to start next year. It's been a little bit delayed um, by COVID, which has affected the build on site, but the, the heat source in terms of the mine water is, is there and ready to go. 
This is another project we're working on with Gateshead Council. So they're planning a six megawatt heat network extension to an existing one that they already have. They've got um, funding from the Heat Networks Investment Project to do this. Um, and they're going to connect domestic and commercial buildings to this heat network. And this one we're about to start uh, drilling for this project, hopefully um, towards the end of the year or early next year. So this one's been a really good one to get involved with. Um, really exciting to see it evolve. So it's it's been great to work on this really, really supportive and enthusiastic council. So really looking forward to getting this one going. So hopefully from that, I will have uh, demonstrated that, or at least given you the reason why we view this as an asset of strategic importance for the UK. We've turned what was a liability into something that has lots of uses and provides one solution for decarbonizing heat but it's also compatible with other low carbon sources of heat and electricity, particularly if we can capitalize on the storage and it links with a lot of the kind of um, UK strategies for clean growth, our energy strategy and industrial strategy. It has a place with, with all of, within all of those and um, things like food and energy, water and climate resilience, it links really strongly with that as well. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. And I apologise for our network trying to cut me off halfway through that. Indeed, Charlotte, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. I learned a lot today. And now I will hand over to Sebastian to chair the question and answer session. Thank you. Yes, so thank you very much. Um, it's it's always a really fascinating story to see how industry that was so important for the UK and for many parts of Europe and that has become almost synonymous with um, climate change now offers an opportunity to, to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, in terms of questions, so we have a question here from Christine Meyer who asks, how do you model water flow in the mine network and what kind of uncertainties do you need to consider in op um, or forecasting? Yeah, it's a really operations. good question that. So that's something we're very well aware that needs to be done. Um, we, we don't model it too much at the moment in terms of, um, I mean, it, we don't model the heat flow. We do model water flow. So we use um, hydrogeological models and we have all our monitoring data that we use for that. But when we get to the point where we've got maybe one or two or more mine water schemes in one block, then there is potential for interaction between them. So we're we're doing quite a lot of work with the academic community on modeling heat so that we know how quickly heat is recharged recharged and how it moves around because that's key for these things going forwards. Once we've got more of them running, we really need to know how they interact with each other. Great, thank you. So let's take a there's suddenly a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so Will Bill Rossen, one of our previous speakers, had, um, had a question, and I think you've answered this. I mean, he said actually then, oh, is he? I think you have answered this. In terms of the four stages, how far along is the most advanced project so far? So these were the two, just to clarify, these were the two projects we talked yeah. about at the at the very end. Or is there something Those that's the even further advanced? We've been involved with, yes, um, the one at CM and the one at Gateshead, there is already a commercial scheme operating that we weren't involved with, um, which is um, a wine producer in the Northeast. And that's actually the UK's biggest geothermal scheme. I think that's around about 3.6 megawatts, that one. Um, and that's used to keep warehouses at the correct temperature for wine. So it's a great place to go and visit if you get a chance. I and mean, then you like wine. <laughs> There's one question I think that's sort of probably on, on the top of many people's mindset. Um, Florian, just thanks for the great talk. What are the minimum and maximum CO2 emissions that you or that you think can be saved in the UK by converting homes to um, mine, uh, pro producing heating, district heating from mine waters? Has that been estimated? We've done from uh, some of the sites and examples we've looked at we estimate that you're probably um, the CO2 emissions are around about a quarter of what they would be using 
the gas source. Um, and then obviously, if you can integrate more renewables to offset the electricity consumption of the heat pump, then you can drop that down as well. And that's, that's what we've estimated for some of ours. That's quite a substantial amount, because I think in the UK, about 50% of the total energy consumption is for, for heating, is that right? Yeah, so potentially so, it would make an impact. In, certainly, in, obviously, you've got to have the mines there, but certainly for some of those larger urban areas, we could make a big impact with it. So a number of questions that look at to ask about risks. Um, so first one is by Masood. Um, and yes, again, thank you for the talk. How do you make sure that by pumping water out of old tunnels that they won't collapse in long term, which subsequently cause, can cause subsidence in the surface? Do you monitor the returned water? We, um, I mean, we would monitor that, but we, um, because we're putting the stuff back in, we don't really intend to create drawdown where we would potentially create subsidence. So, um, I mean, obviously, that's something that we will monitor. But even though we're kind of abstracting from and re-injecting to different seams, they're all connected together. So effectively, it is like a big bath full of water. You're just taking it from different mm -hmm. levels. Um, so because we're not removing water all the time, um, then there shouldn't be much change um, at, you know, at surface. The places where we pump already, we're just removing the overflow effectively. So we're not drawing down there either. We're just keeping it constant. Curtis Oldenburg, um, one of our upcoming speakers, has a question. Um, is, it, is there dissolved methane in the water and or is this a problem in terms of, a, of its off-gassing as a greenhouse gas? We generally don't have a lot. We find that um, because the mines are flooded, as, as they've flooded the gas production, stops because the sites where it would be produced kind of on the the little kind of fractures within the coal are sealed off effectively by the water being there so we do always do a gas risk assessment and we do monitor gas when we're drilling um, but we we don't see that as a big problem from what we've observed already good question though thank you thanks a question from ronsky blades i don't know if that's the full name or um, pseudonym. Hi, Charlotte, thanks for the talk. Can you talk a little bit about the associated cost for the last project you talked about? Well, I mean, that's some of that is kind of confidential to the council, really. Um, so it's a bit difficult to talk about that as such. I mean, I, I don't know what specifically, what areas of cost. I mean, I can give you a rough idea for drilling the boreholes. Um, uh, which which is a generic one that we use, you know, for, for the projects that we're working on. So generic, we're looking at around about a thousand pounds per meter for a borehole. Um, and the, the costs vary very much depending on what you're wanting to do really and how you configure the system. Um, you know, you, you could be, I don't know, the heat pumps, you've got different options there. You might have it decentralized, you might have it centralized. So. They are quite bespoke, so it is difficult to give you a cost per kilowatt hour for a mine energy scheme because they are very bespoke, but they are quite versatile as well. So you can have them for lots of different applications. So um, it's very difficult to give you cost, but for boreholes around about a thousand pounds per meter is what we work on. Okay, thank you. We have another question here and it's pretty, I guess you've answered this um, um, about, any other risks? So, um, Mr. JV, uh, J wonders if there's any risk of induced seismicity in these operations. I guess yeah. I can, we can make a guess what the answer is going to be. Yeah, I mean, we would, we would not expect that because, again, we're putting the water back in. Um, I know at the UK Geos test site in Glasgow, they do have seismic monitoring there and they will be conducting experiments on the wells they've got there. So I guess that will provide some good data. Um, we, I know that the coal fields are being monitored by satellites in terms of their, and there's quite a few people have done research on that. Um, so in places where, where there was mining, obviously there was a um, decrease in surface level. As the waters come up, what we've seen is that in some places, 
um, areas are still rising very slightly as the water levels come up um, underground. So we see we do see movement because obviously anything you do to the subsurface is going to respond in some way or another. I think the key thing is that it's not sudden changes, so you're not triggering um, seismic events. Thank you. We do have a question from our very own co-chair. Man asks, how does the water composition influence the success of the project? Do you expect clogging or scaling issues comparable to what you have in normal geothermal projects? Yeah, I mean, you've got the, the things for us are um, some of the water can be very saline, so it can be much more saline than seawater. So obviously you've got to design all the components so that they can cope with high salinity water. And the key thing for us is the ochre precipitation, which obviously in the treatment systems, we want to capitalize on that. So we get as much oxygen through the mine water as possible to get the ochre to drop out as fast as we can. And that's the last thing we'd want in a mine energy system. So that's achieved by keeping everything under positive pressure and excluding air from the system so that we can't get the ochre to come out. But you're right, things that are not designed correctly um, that can be a big problem. It has been challenges for other projects. And also some of our mine waters are, aer are aerated a bit because of the way they're pumped and the way they flow. Um, but because we're quite used to dealing with that, then it's, it's a problem that we can easily engineer around as long as you're aware of it. Mm. Thank you. I do, have, I do have a question myself. What is it, the public acceptance of converting old mines, abandoned mines into district heating networks in the UK and, and more broadly across other parts of the world. So is that something in Germany or parts of the US? Is something we could scale up? Um, is there a lot of resistance with a not in my backyard type approach? Because they are, if you think of Glasgow, they're close, very close to um, densely populated areas in some cases. Yeah, I mean, we haven't experienced um negativity towards it so we've um some work i was doing at durham we were working with a, a mining former mining town in county durham and we were looking at whether we could have a new development there that ran off mine energy and because there was a lot of former miners still left and their families were still left they were really positive about it and a lot of them felt that you know there was so much effort went into creating all those tunnels underground and they just sat idle and full of water we're very excited about the fact that you could use it as a future source of energy. And I think in some cases, you know, they realized that the coal they pulled out had been a contributor to climate change. But then this was seen as a way forwards from that. So the fact that that coal has been mined, traded and burnt and is gone and had its impact upon the environment, the water that's come in to replace it, you can use that over and over again. So it's a really strong message for um people in former mining areas and they're generally very positive about it from all, from our experience thank you we do have a question from noor asis um who asks, do you think transporting co2 to abandoned mines is still a big problem if you utilize main tailings to keep the project financially feasible so is there any issue around co2 in mines in terms of what but CO2 storage is that, or sorry, I think I think so, yes, yeah, so the coal bed methane approach. Yeah, I mean, we we're not really directly involved in that. Obviously, we would be licensing those type of operations with it going ahead. And um, we do ask get asked about the mines for CO2 storage and their potential for that. In the same way, we've been asked about them for hydrogen storage, because they are so well connected in the UK it can be difficult. So um, it's not something we've really put a lot of time into. We tend to say for CO2 storage, it's probably not gonna work. For something like hydrogen storage, it might work if you put it in a shaft, but you probably have to line the shaft before, well, you'd certainly have to line the shaft before you did it. Um, so yeah, does that answer the question? I hope so. Let Noor answer, <laughs> provide the answer. Yeah, that answer the question. <laughs> Uh, we have another question from Azut, um, and he asks, wonders if you have seen differences in the water when that you produce when you pr that is being produced from long wall mining versus room pillar mining. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that we can differenti differentiate that because I don't know how many of our discharges come from 
one source or the other. I suspect there's probably a mix of both types of mine in, in all of them. But the UK Geos site um, in Glasgow, I know that has drilled into different targets. So it would be quite an interesting research question to get some samples from those wells when they're pumped and see if there's a difference. Um, mm. I guess it could be poorer where you've got long wall because there's much more broken rock that the water will have flowed through. So potentially they could have, it could have picked up more stuff because there's more surface area there from that broken rock but then the flow will be slower through that than through a mine system. So less water will probably go through it. So interesting question though. So just sort of curiosity, another question from my side, um, are there many collapsed mines? Because you talked about broken up rocks, um, some of the older mine shafts, are they collapsed? Or are they filled with abandoned vehicles, carts, etc.? So you showed these pictures of this beautiful, mine shaft that is empty and but is that always the case or do we find old rubbish rubber boots um yeah. whatever left sandwich boxes lunch boxes left yeah. behind yeah there, there is quite a lot of stuff down there i mean i've done when i was um formerly at before i was at durham and before i was in industry i was at newcastle university i did quite a lot of depth samples from shafts and i did get my depth sampler stuck around something I had to actually cut the end of it off because I couldn't, I even tried to pull it out with the Land Rover and it wouldn't come out. So um, it was definitely stuck. We've done quite a few camera surveys. So at the sites where we put pumps down the existing shafts to use them for our treatment systems, we always do camera surveys first to pick the best one in, and also to look at the condition of the shaft in terms of its integrity and in terms of what might be down there. So you do often see that, for example, the cage that would have ridden up and down the shaft, that's still in there the cables from the head frame would have been cut and just dropped down there. So you may find quite a bit of infrastructure still down there and the odd hammer and, and boots, as you say. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for a really interesting talk. I mean, it's, as I said, it's so, you, you emphasize this numbers, and it's so fascinating to see how, how something that was so, so important to so many, it has fueled our society and our economy for many decades. It's now, um, no longer in vogue and it still has such a potential for future energy supply so it's absolutely fascinating to see um i'm going to close the q a session now hand over for to Maren for some final words and then just mention our next week's speaker thank you yeah thanks charlotte again it was really inspiring today uh, now we're pleased to announce our speaker of next week which has been on jeff poor from the University of Southern California. Uh, he will talk about low rank representations for subsurface flow and roof problems from Fourier to Wavelet to Deep Learning. We are very much looking forward to welcoming you next week again. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you much, everyone. See you next week. Thank you.